spring seminar. We're happy to have Sudarshan Anand from ISA Pune with us today. And he's going to tell us about an intricate path to gravity. Over to you. Over to you, Sudarshan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you confirm that you can see my screen and hear me? Yeah, yeah, your screen. Okay, also. thanks. So let me start by thanking the organizers for this invitation. And also, I, I will especially mention Joel because he, uh, I had to request a postponement and he very nicely uh, took care of that. Uh, uh, so I'm uh, very happy to present some work on, uh, I, I don't exactly know what it's on, but uh, the title is An Intricate Path to Gravity. And uh, I'm going to cover all these topics, so the, which is why I'm, uh, I'm a little unclear on how exactly to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Uh, I'm going to cover light cone gauge. I'm going to cover Yang Mills theory. I'm going to cover super Yang Mills theory. Then I'll cover gravity, then super gravity, and then back to gravity. So the intricate path is because it's, this is sort of a bunch of stuff that finally, hopefully gets to gravity. That's the plan. So let me, uh, the, the way I've structured this is I've got a bunch of ingredients or tools that I will use in this gravity, super gravity system. But I think these tools are better understood in the Yang Mill system. So I'm going to explain the tools here and then we'll move over here where the results are uh, uh, more cumbersome. So uh, we can sort of uh, summarize the results here carrying over the tools from here. Um, the, as always, I just wanted to say, please feel free to stop me if there are any questions or something's not clear. So uh, I, I will start in four dimensions. And in four dimensions, I will work with uh, uh, these light cone coordinates. So I, you take the time coordinate and the Z coordinate of space, and they combine into X plus and X minus. X plus will be time, the new time. And then the, the transverse coordinates x and y will combine into x and its conjugate x bar. So in this, in this notation, the flat space metric is now entirely off diagonal. So no diagonal entries and minus sign for the time part. Now, uh, I, I will work in light cone gauge and I will tell you why I, I work a lot in light cone gauge in a, in a few slides. But uh, there are two approaches to the light cone gauge. The first is uh, what I would call a, a more boring approach, which is somebody gives you a, a covariant Lagrangian and then you gauge fix it, okay? The other approach is called the symmetry-based approach, which I will uh, review on in a couple of slides. Uh, the symmetry-based approach makes, just starts from these two points that massless fields have exactly two physical degrees of freedom and the little group, relevant little group in four dimensions is SO2. So that's the symmetry-based approach. I'll, I'll explain that in a couple of slides. Right now, let me just show you the standard uh, gauge fixing uh, that many of you would have seen before. So uh, if I want to do electrodynamics in the light cone gauge, I write down a Lagrangian, which is one quarter F mu nu, F mu nu. The field strength is here. Um, and then I have this one degree of freedom. I'm allowed to shift this. Uh, gauge field without making any uh, physical changes. And the gauge field has these four components. This one uh, gauge degree, this one degree of freedom allows me to choose one component. So I choose A lower minus and set it to zero. Because the metric is off diagonal, A lower minus is related to the negative of A upper plus and they vanish. Now X plus is light cone time. So when you, when you write out del mu f mu nu equal to zero in light cone coordinates, you find that one of them does not involve a time derivative, uh, implying that it's, it holds for all times and it's a constraint. That allows me to eliminate a lower plus. So now I've got rid of a lower plus and a lower minus, and I end up with a, uh, this is free, the free theory. I end up with a Lagrangian, which is entirely based on the two physical degrees of freedom, a and a bar. So 
sorry, I don't know if it's just me, but uh, Sudarshan, I can't hear you. Uh, Vishal, are you, are you there? No, yeah, I think internet got disconnected. Oh, you got disconnected? Yeah. Huh. Just wait, wait a minute for him to... Do you have his number or something, Vishal? No, I, I don't have. I'll just send him a quick mail. Maybe if... Uh... I have Sudarshan's number if you want. Ha, ah, sure. That'll be great, actually. So maybe if you could send it to Vishal. Yeah, it's 976662. Uh, just, just one second, please. Uh, one second. I can write it in the chat if you want. Okay, great. Yeah, everyone will get it. Then. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Vishal, are you are you calling? Uh, uh, yeah, he, he he's not picking the call as well. He's not picking the call. Yeah, he just wait for two, two minutes. Or so. Hello. Hello. Ah, uh, hi, Sudarshan. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm very sorry. I I don't know my institute internet, which I thought was super reliable, just shut off. So That's okay. I'm on mobile data now. I may have to switch again. My apologies for this. Uh, uh, I also don't know when I got cut off. Did I did I get to this slide? Which right now we you're not sharing screen right now. Ah. Uh, Sorry. Or maybe uh, at least I can't see your screen. Yeah, you were here. Yeah. How about now? Yeah, yeah. Now you can see the screen. And you were in this slide. Yeah. Is my screen visible now? Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, could someone please tell me how far I got? Did, did I cover this slide or? Uh, yes, you said you had you had a free theory and you had this Lagrangian, which was a bar box A. Uh, you didn't, yeah. Okay. You were towards the end of this slide, yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, uh, on this slide, uh, the, the, this is the negative helicity state and this is the positive helicity state. Now, the symmetry-based approach is what, what happens with the symmetry-based approach is that just purely on sort of dimensional considerations and the fact that phi is natural dimension of a field scales like one by length, you can write down a Lagrangian to be D3x phi bar box phi. And from this, you can derive the Hamiltonian uh, PQ dot minus L, which gives you this form. And this delta H on phi becomes the Hamiltonian operator. Now, the light cone time is X plus, And this implies that del lower plus, which is the negative of del upper minus, is the light cone Hamiltonian. So this delta H, the Hamiltonian operator, 
uh, which can be thought of as this Poisson bracket. For the free theory has the form del del bar over del plus on phi. This one over del plus, let me say a quick word about it. For the purposes of this talk, I will simply treat it as um, an integral of this form. And the way you would check that this makes sense is you bring a del plus from the left side. You act it here, it'll cancel this. You bring a del plus from this side. It'll act on the step function, give a delta, you integrate and the two sides match. So the free theory is this. And the key point in the light cone is that this Hamiltonian, uh, okay, this isn't specific to light cone. This Hamiltonian will pick up corrections when interactions are switched off. Now, uh, uh, the, the idea here is that I have to guess what these interactions are. So the, the aim behind this light cone approach is I want to derive new theories that are not already known. So with that in mind, I would say, uh, let me guess what the Hamiltonian is at the next order. Here's a coupling constant. Uh, and then I sprinkle a bunch of derivatives raised to various powers, B, C, rho, mu, et cetera. And I importantly have two fields here, which means it's the next order. I'm looking at cubic order. I remind you that uh, this delta H phi is, uh, is multiplied from the front by another phi. So phi times this will be a cubic vertex. Now, what happens in a light cone is, and this is a kind of obvious, I took A mu and I removed A minus and A plus, one from a constraint and one was set to zero by a gauge choice, which means a vector no longer has four components. So Lorentz invariance is no longer manifest, okay? So I have to sit and check Lorentz invariance. And so in what we do is instead of viewing this as a pain, we say, okay, glass half full, Let's all be optimists and turn this to our advantage and say the requirement of Lorentz invariance will in fact determine the Hamiltonian. And uh, here's an example. Here's the rotation generator in four dimensions. It rotates between say uh, angular momentum between X and Y. And if I ask that this operator commute with the Hamiltonian, I get a condition on these various factors here, this B, C, rho, B, C, D, E, and so on relating to lambda. Now, the nice thing is you have a ton of such conditions. Here's the Lorentz algebra in its full glory in light cone. So I have so many of these uh, commutators. I would primarily focus on the ones where the Hamiltonian is involved. So one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. And with this, it turns out you can entirely determine the Hamiltonian, actually determine it completely. Now, what are some of the results you find? So here's a very old result from 1983 that you cannot have a cubic vertex for a spin one field. So if you have a spin one field, like a gauge field, you are not allowed a cubic interaction vertex, self-interaction. Why? Because when you write out this object, you get this minus this, which works out to zero. This is what comes after you, you satisfy all the Lorentz commutators. So here you say, hold on, I already know that there are cubic vertices in Yang Mills. So is there a way to fix this? And the answer is yes. Uh, notice this operator acts on field one here and on field two here. So you can say, uh, hold on, if I introduce an anti-symmetric constant FABC and put indices on these objects, then I could get these two terms to combine. So it is this uh, requirement of Lorentz invariance in the light cone that tells you to introduce an anti-symmetric constant FABC. Now, interestingly, this was not extended to next order explicitly. So I did this with my students in 2017. Uh, I, nothing new about this. Everybody knew this, but still the explicit calculation, which shows that if you now go to the next order in the Hamiltonian, go to G squared, and again, look for a Lorentz, Lorentz invariance, you find that this object, which up to this point was merely anti-symmetric, now has to obey the Jacobi identity. And so you start seeing the gauge group emerge from this uh, Lorentz invariance. So having done all this, you end up with the Yang Mills uh, Lagrangian in light cone gauge. Can I quickly ask if there are any questions, if anyone wants to say anything or ask me a question? Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm struggling a bit with this video blocking my slide, but. Anyway, uh, am I still audible? Sorry. Yeah, you're audible. Okay, thanks. 
So uh, here's the kinetic term. Here are the cubic vertices with the indices put in with the anti-symmetric object. And here's the quartic vertex. Now, I, I want to highlight here that if you focus on the SO2 little group and helicity, you find here there's minus and plus. Here's there's minus and two pluses. Here there's plus and two minus. And here there's uh, plus minus plus minus. Why is that interesting? Because of the next slide, which is you can connect this directly to physics. So uh, the connection to physics is like this. In the light cone, uh, I'll define this funny bracket uh, this way. And this is something uh, I'm sure people have seen before, that we know that a large number of Feynman diagrams uh, shrink to very simple answers at tree level. And for example, Park and Taylor have these nice results from long ago that if all the external legs, gluons you're looking at have uh, positive helicity or all but one, then those amplitudes vanish. And only in the case where exactly two of the external legs are negative helicity and everything else is positive, you get this non-vanishing result, which again has a very nice form. And uh, of course, you can complex conjugate everything I'm saying. So with that caveat. Uh, so what this essentially means is that we are calculating, for example, here, you're calculating 500,000 diagrams to arrive at extremely simple results. And this is not good for morale. You can imagine a beginning PhD student being asked to do 500,000 diagrams. And then after one year, you tell them, oh, the, I knew the answer already. It, it, it's not good for uh, spirits in the corridor. So, so we want to focus on this. And what is behind this? The, what is behind this is that manifest Lorentz invariance seems to obscure a lot of the symmetries in these theories. So this, this sort of tells you that maybe for some applications, so uh, Lorentz covariance, uh, staring at a Lagrangian and knowing it's Lorentz invariant, these are valuable. But for certain applications, perhaps they're worth sacrificing. Uh, so, a uh, large number of Feynman diagram mysteriously turn into simple expressions. What's the connection to what I just showed you? Here's the Lagrangian I just showed you how to derive. It turns out that if you stare at this enough, you realize that this vertex, the quartic, and this vertex, the cubic, both are following the rule that there should be two negative helicity legs. So we leave them alone. But then we are upset with this vertex because this vertex seems to have only one negative helicity and two positive. And that means any diagram you build. So suppose I start building an S-channel diagram for a, a four-point interaction and I use two of this, I'm going to have a bunch of plus helicities floating around. And I know that ultimately those will vanish. So why am I working on something that's zero? So the answer to that is that you simply have to field redefine these two into a new kinetic term. So here's that map. You freely redefine the kinetic term plus the bad cubic vertex into a new kinetic term uh, in the process changing variables from A to B. And you are making manifest what is known that that part of the theory is free. And here's the resulting Lagrangian. And you may notice that these structures that you know from the Park Taylor, they start appearing now as coefficients. There's still a, a, a point about making things on, sh on shell, but the structures start to appear. So you start seeing amplitude structures directly. Uh, this arrow here and the dot, dot, dot tell you that there is a law of conservation of trouble, which is that this Yang-Mills Lagrangian stopped at G squared. This MHV Lagrangian does not stop. It keeps going. And at any for any number of external gluons, you can simply pick the appropriate coefficient and put it on shell. This also works for gravity. Okay, so this is a, a summary of light cone and Yang Mills. And I, I would now like to come to some of the questions uh, that I'm going to answer in this talk. And they're actually not directly connected to what I've talked about so far. So one of the questions I'm interested in is, is there a hidden symmetry in N equals H supergravity that explains its sort of better than expected ultraviolet properties? I won't call them good ultraviolet properties, but better than expected. And also do the enhanced symmetries in N equals eight theory serve as signposts to new and larger structures? So if, if for example, you want to know more about a larger theory, something that subsumes uh, everything we know, uh, can we do a bottom up approach where we start with the field theory and then sort of see what indications are uh, provided regarding larger symmetry groups? 
this could tie in with work on exceptional symmetries and so on. Uh, as I said, I, 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 before I get to supergravity, I want to talk about super Yang Mills. So again, let me pause and ask, uh, are there questions? Anyone uh, have anything to add or say? Hi, I just had a quick question. Would you be making any comments about the UV finiteness of N equals eight? Uh, I will. Uh, I, I will not make any useful comments, but I will definitely make comments. All right, great, thanks. Uh, I, I will talk about both UV finiteness in n equals four and n equals eight, but uh, I, I, I'll, I'll also qualify why my answer is not particularly useful. But anyway. But uh, just uh, excusing my impatience, I mean, uh, do, uh, is there a quick, what, what will be the quick answer to is n equals eight UV finite or not? I, I think it's not. Uh, and I, I, I told you, I think. Uh, uh, I, what I will say is that I, I, I think I have a sort of classification that tells you by how much it's not, not finite. So I'll try and quantify by how much it fails to be finite. Great, thanks. D does that roughly? Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I look forward to uh, that portion of the talk. Okay, uh, so any other questions or comments? Okay, so as I said, I want to build a toolkit with n equals four Yang Mills. So let me start there. We now move from Yang Mills to super Yang Mills and we'll do that using light cone and super space. So we start with SU4. This is secretly because we know that there is an SO6R symmetry. So, and SO6 is SU4. So uh, we introduce theta Grassmann variables, theta, theta bar M and their chiral derivatives in terms of them. And then we introduce this chiral coordinate so let me point out, I'm leaving the light cone bosonic coordinates that we've uh, talked about so far, x, x bar, x plus alone, but the x minus coordinate is shifted in theta, theta bar. It's somewhat similar to any superspace. And again, the point being that in this light cone symmetry approach, the super Poincare, now Poincare algebra is now replaced by super Poincare algebra. The super Poincare algebra will entirely determine the action for n equals four. Yang Mills theory. So let me talk about n equals four Yang Mills theory. I, I'm I'm sorry in terms of uh, the overall talk. I would have liked something uh, cleaner in terms of a path, but I I hope the title indicated that I'm going to meander a little bit to make my point, and I, I hope finally it's clear that I didn't have too much of a choice. So here is the n equals four superfield. A superfield is basically a collection of all the fields together so you can work with one object rather than many. So uh, in this super field, the gauge field sits here and here. Uh, you have the uh, fermions here and the scalars here. And if you want to count one, four, six, four, one. Uh, the scalar C bar MN, remember that, so remember this uh, N equals four theory has a 10 dimensional origin in N equals one, Yang Mills in 10 dimensions. The little group there is SO8. From SO8, you remove the SO2 in four dimensions, leaving you with SO6. So these are the six scalars. The six scalars I'm writing as SU4 by spinners, uh, M not equal to four. And you can work out what those components are from this relation. Now this superfield satisfies chirality and uh, its conjugate satisfies an anti-chiral condition. I want to stress one point about maximally supersymmetric theories like N equals four, that they obey an inside out relation. That is simply the statement that the lowest component here in the superfield and the highest component measured in terms of theta are referring to the same field. So this only happens with maximally supersymmetric theories and that is the statement here. Uh, the, the specific details of the equation are not so important. So uh, let me, I, I'll try and summarize the, the important uh, bigger picture as we go along. So uh, again, in terms of the Poincare algebra, now we have the super Poincare algebra. And in light cone, you split them into what are called kinematic and what are called dynamic. So here are the kinematic generators, including the supersymmetry generators. And then we have the dynamic generators, which include the Hamiltonian and uh, dynamic supersymmetry generators, which anti-commute to give the Hamiltonian. Again, at the risk of repeating myself, these generators pick up corrections when interactions are switched on. 
Now, this is the N equals four Yang Mills theory Lagrangian. I remind you in the light cone, we don't have ghosts and uh, uh, we deal exclusively with physical degrees of freedom. So everything we need is here. Uh, I'm sorry, am I audible? It says my internet connection is patchy. Yeah, audible. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is the N equals four Yang Mills Lagrangian, kinetic term, cubic term, and quartic term. Uh, in this formalism, again, uh, N equals four supersymmetry and SU four R symmetry are manifest, but Lorentz invariance is not. Now, uh, uh, relating to the, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know who asked me the question. I can't see pictures here. So, relating to the question I was asked, uh, this formulation is is useful. Again, you want to formulate theories in different ways, and each formulation tends to have a particularly is particularly well suited to one application. I think this is why in school teachers told us to try a problem in different ways, uh, or at least the, the few good teachers we had. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this formulation was used to prove that all green functions in the theory are finite. Let me, in one slide, this is an aside, in one slide, let me summarize how that works. Why is N equals four Yang Mills theory a finite theory? Uh, you draw a, a complicated supergraph. Here it is. Uh, this is a complicated supergraph. You can see all sorts of junk is happening inside. You make a preliminary estimate for the superficial degree of divergence, and you find it zero in this formalism for any super diagram. However, this assumes that all momenta contribute to the loop integral. Mm -hmm. Then at the next, or next step, refinement step two, you analyze supergraphs distinguishing between internal and external lines, and then show that superspace manipulations allow you to reduce delta to a negative value for any diagram. Repeat this analysis for all subgraphs within an arbitrary supergraph. And then the Weinberg power counting theorem tells you that green functions are finite in this gauge, which is scale invariance. And scale invariance becomes a gauge independent statement. So then you're good to go. So uh, this proof, by the way, uh, was done by Mandelstam and a slightly different formalism by Bengtsson, Bengtsson, Brink. Uh, with two fellow postdocs, we repeated this proof for other theories. But I, I, think, our, I think the main value in our paper was that we were uh, more uh, lengthy and explicit than these two rather brief papers. So let's, I, I want to just uh, place this on record because when I get to n equals eight, I will have a couple of lines on why this same thing doesn't work there. Uh, are there any questions? Let me stop. Okay. So um, let me move now to uh, this N equals four Yang Mills theory. Uh, one special property that I will use in later in the talk. And that is that the Hamiltonian is a quadratic form. So here's the dynamical supersymmetry generator I told you about. I told you the commutator of two dynamical SUSIs is the Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian is for n equals four Yang Mills is a quadratic form. And by quadratic form, I mean uh, precisely this, that it's effectively the square of some object and that object is this W. I, I will stress that this is not equivalent to the statement that the Hamiltonian is an anti-commutator, which is true for any SUSE theory, okay? It is only for the maximally supersymmetric theories that the two terms in the anti-commutator in this light cone superspace formalism can be combined. And so you end up with a quadratic form. So this, this quadratic form structure will play an important role in what I'm going to talk about. Now, uh, the, the last tool I need, after this, I move to gravity. This is the last piece of the toolkit I need. And I will use each of these later in the talk. So the, the last thing is about uh, something called oxidation. So I, we want to ask at this point, N equals four Yang Mills theory came from 10 dimensions. And in 10 dimensions, I had this vector. And what we did was we took SO8 and we split it into SO2 times SO6. This SO2 became the vector. The SO6 were the scalars. So if you want, you can write eight vector is six plus one plus one, these subscripts being helicity. So we want to ask whether we can go back to 10 dimensions, okay? Now, ordinarily, you do not expect to be able to do this, but the beauty with supersymmetric, maximally supersymmetric theories is that you are trying to preserve supercharges as you move up and down. 
And so I'm, we're going to attempt that. And what I'm going to do is I'll first introduce the missing six missing coordinates. I'm in four dimensions. I want six missing coordinates. So I introduce them again as SU4 by spinners. Here's uh, I put m equal to one, I get x4 plus i x7. So I've introduced x4 and x7. Then I put x m equal to two and so on. So you get back all the coordinates for 10 corresponding derivatives. And the superfield, the very nice thing about this is that the superfield does not need modification because what you, the four dimensional human, were seeing as a vector here and here and six scalars, this supreme being in SO8 who lives in 10 dimensions and sees things in and from an, wearing SO8 glasses will recognize this, the six scalars and this component to be merely the eight, eight components of a vector. So there's not much work to do with the superfield. You can use the same superfield, except now these coordinates have the added dependence on these uh, six dimensions. But you're not home yet you have to explicitly check SO8 invariance. How do you do this? We have the SO2 generators because I was working in four dimensions. I now introduce the SO6 generators. These are objects that you can, this part you can write down by intuition. You want to rotate between the uh, say fourth and seventh direction and seventh and fourth direction that will determine these. And then the spin part you can work out. But you also need, so you have SO2, you have SO6. What are you missing? You're missing the coset generators of SO8 over SO2 times SO6. Those are these objects. I think they should be 12 or six, and then there'll be six more. So quick count, SO8 is uh, SO8, SO2 is one generator, SO6 is 15. This is 28, so you have a difference of 12. So with these new generators, you find that you have the entire SO8 Lie algebra. And now you go back to this Lagrangian. You go back to this Lagrangian and you notice a couple of interesting things. First of all, the, in the interacting theory, let's forget the kinetic term, in the interacting theory, the quartic vertex does not involve transverse derivatives. Now this is very, very happy for us because that means I don't have to take an SO2 transverse derivative and enlarge it to involve SO6 transverse derivatives. However, I see the evil object here. I have an SO2 object in the cubic vertex. That's not okay. I don't want SO2 invariance in 10 dimensions. I want SO8 invariance. So you propose a new derivative, a generalized derivative, which takes the SO2, the two di directions, and adds to it the six directions with appropriate superspace derivatives, dimensions taken care of and a floating constant. I will point out that these chiral derivatives, the superspace derivatives commute with supersymmetry. And I also want to stress that you can check the invariant. You can't just define a new vector for fun. You have to check that it transforms covariantly and it behaves like a vector and so on, which has been done here. Having done all this, you then propose a cubic vertex in 10 dimensions. Let me go back again, sorry, one more time to the four dimensional theory. All I'm going to do is replace this del bar here by a nabla bar. So having done that. So I think your voice has become a little faint for some reason. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me up the volume. Is this better now? Yeah, it is much better, yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So the only change I make is in the cubic vertex, I replace the del bar by nabla bar. And now you have to sit and vary this entire Lagrangian using the SO8, all the SO8 generators and you find that it is SO8 invariant. Therefore, you've recovered the 10 dimensional theory simply by replacing nabla uh, del bar by nabla bar. And you've preserved supersymmetry because the operation you use to oxidize or to go up commutes with the supersymmetry in the theory. This is the basic message that if you have a theory in a lower dimension, you can lift it to an up. In this particular formalism, let me not speak loosely, in this light cone superspace formalism, when dealing with maximally supersymmetric theories, you can recover, you can go back to the higher dimensional progenitor by carefully choosing a generalized derivative. So let me pause and ask if there are questions because now I have built the toolkit here. I'm now going to use it in, gravi in the gravity system. Are there any questions or comments? I just had a, a, a probably a, a silly comment, but still I'll, I'll venture to make the same. Uh, this property of inside out, 
uh, is it correct that it, it, uh, it actually involves uh, uh, a levitch vita and a complex conjugation process in the same operation? Uh, that's right. So, so actually, uh, so, the, so the common the reason simply being you have to match indices. So to pull these indices down, I, I'm in SU4. So I have a four index object here. To pull these two down, I need these. But lower indices are conjugates of upper indices. So I have to conjugate. Okay, so uh, the, com I, the comment that I wanted to make was actually there, this seems to remind me of uh, uh, what is called as, uh, you know, when one studies uh, vector bundle cohomology in algebraic geometry, so there is this notion of construction for ser dual. So uh, a, a ser duality is in essentially what combines Hodge duality with complex conjugation. So this seems to be uh, something which is appearing uh, in an N equals four uh, light cone superspace form. Hello. Hello. Uh, was I audible? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Was Was I audible? Uh, no, I couldn't hear that last bit. Okay. Uh, so can I make a request? Can you just yeah. hold on for a second? And sure, if sure, I could sure. ask the organizers, can I log out and log back in on my main machine? I'm sorry yeah. to be bothered. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Audible now? Yes. Ah, thank you. This is much better. I'm back on my uh, main machine. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, Oh yeah, I just was making a, a, a parallel uh, between uh, this concept of inside outness yes. and the, uh, the concept of ser duality in uh, algebraic geometry involving vector bundle cohomology, which involves uh, looking at construction for a complex conjugate of a Hodge dual. So you have uh, the Hodge duality levitch vita and you also have complex conjugation in the same dual. So this reminds me of that. There seems to be uh, some kind of uh, uh, connection between uh, n equals four uh, superspace in light cone and uh, ser duality, I mean, inside oh. outness. This okay, I, I I I can't comment because I actually don't know too much about this. Yeah, uh, just okay. Yeah, right. So uh, since I'm back on my main machine, I have the opportunity to do something here, which I couldn't do on my laptop. Uh, I wanted to show you this, uh, the path. So I promised an outline to my talk at some point. So here it is. The, the promised outline goes like this. I, I want to take a parent theory. I, I, I want to, okay, I actually started here. So I, I start with a parent theory. I reduce it to a lower dimensional theory where the symmetry gets enhanced. And then, but the symmetry is not manifest. I feel redefined to make the symmetry manifest. And then I use this oxidation trick in, in light cone superspace to get back to the parent theory with an enhanced symmetry. So this is the outline of my talk. And this is why I called, I said it's a bit of a convoluted path. Uh, this is roughly what I want to explain today. And I'm more than halfway through my talk in case, uh, in terms of time. So uh, any other comments or shall I go on? Okay, so uh, let me start with the gravity supergravity part. Uh, here is gravity in the light cone gauge. Again, as I said, the best way to do gravity in the light cone gauge is on using the symmetry based approach. But just for uh, so that the material is more familiar, let me do the traditional way, which is you start with the covariant Lagrangian and gauge fix. So here's the Lagrangian. Uh, I impose three gauge choices here. I said G minus minus is, so I start with G mu nu. I said G minus minus is G minus I is zero, three gauge choices. I make a fourth gauge choice here, which is I parameterize G plus minus is minus E to the psi by two and G I J as E to the psi gamma I J, the psi being the same. This gamma I J is the entire story of gravity because it's a unimodular two cross two matrix. And so the physical degrees of freedom live here. Uh, once again, you will find that if you look at say R mu nu equal to zero, uh, you can eliminate this psi, this parameter psi in favor of gamma. And so you find your entire Lagrangian depends on gamma and gamma can be parameterized in the following form. So for example, gamma ij would be something like delta ij plus kappa hij and so on. Once you do all of this, 
you end up with the following Hamiltonian describing light cone gravity to order kappa squared. Here's the kinetic term. These are the cubic vertices. And this giant object is the quartic vertex. Uh, once again, uh, all the stuff I said about MHV and amplitudes holds here. Here's the two positive, helic two positive helicity fields, one negative helicity, and the conjugate here. So this is the story of light cone gravity. I will come back to this uh, in a few slides. I want to now move to supergravity. So uh, in parallel with what I explained for n equals four Yang Mills, we want to look at n equals eight supergravity. Uh, you you've heard many times how similar these theories are. So uh, we use SU eight. We introduce theta and theta bar. And here is the superfield for n equals eight supergravity. I again draw your attention to the inside out mirror kind of uh, constraint that the lowest component here and the highest component with the most thetas refer to the same field. And in terms of counting, you have the one, the eight, the 28, the 56, the, the 70 scalars sit here and so on. Now, uh, here is the inside out relation. Uh, again, uh, the inside out relation is unique to maximally supersymmetric theories. Uh, we write down the, the generator for dynamical supersymmetry at order kappa, and then we can write the Lagrangian to that order. Uh, the, I, we actually know the Lagrangian to order kappa cube, but it simply won't fit on this slide. So I, I'll stop with kappa, but you, you have a general idea of what happens after here. Now, a couple of uh, points, key points. One is that the Hamiltonian is again a quadratic form. This has been shown to order kappa cube. Okay. Now, a valid question and valid criticism of this would be, what is the use of doing something to kappa cube when you haven't done it to all orders? Uh, to this, I don't have an answer. So here is the Hamiltonian. I write it as a quadratic form in terms of this W. Uh, this is the object. And now I will talk about symmetries. So what is known about n equals eight supergravity is that if you come down from 11 dimensions, SO9 will go to SO2, leaving you an SO7. And that SO7 can be upgraded up to an SU8. And later, covariantly, it becomes an E7 at the level of the equations of motion. In light cone, you actually have an explicit E7 symmetry for the theory. And that's what I will quickly describe here. The E7 is 133 generators. It splits into the 63 SU8 linear generators and the coset E7 over SU8 nonlinear generators. So here are some of these generators. This would be the 63, the way to count this is 8 times 8 minus 1. So 64 minus 1 is 63, and the corresponding algebra. This is the uh, coset transformations. The key point I want to make here is that the coset transformations are written in terms of these chiral derivatives, which means it commutes, these, these symmetries commute with supersymmetry. And now here are the two lines. I, I hope I, I hope I I, I reduced any expectations of my comments on n equals eight sufficiently. So here are the comments. If you repeat the same superspace finiteness analysis for n equals eight supergravity, you find that we always fall short by two powers of momentum. Now this in itself is a little surprising because you know how gravity grows, the number of derivatives grow and so on. So you expect things to get really horrible but you find that as long as you restrict yourself to the vertices I, that we know, you find you're always able to use superspace manipulations to get within two powers of momenta of the n equals four result. Okay, And one of the reasons I, this interests me is because, uh, again, in my bottom-up worldview, I think tracking and fixing divergences is a sort of tested way of doing physics. So you look for symmetry enhancements that will help perhaps with this and not necessarily fix it within n equals eight, but point towards a larger framework where this could be addressed. So let me make specific now the, the, the schematic I showed you a little earlier. In the supergravity, uh, sorry, was there a, are there any comments or questions? Uh, okay, uh, so here is the schematic in detail. I start with, I want to start with n equals eight supergravity in four dimensions with an E7 symmetry. I will go down to three dimensions. 
where the theory has an E8 symmetry, I think, but it's not manifest. I'll do a field redefinition, which will make the E8 manifest. And I will show that for this particular system, this oxidation procedure I described does not mess with the E8 invariance or the supersymmetry, allowing us to get back here with E8 invariance. So here's step one. I reduce to three dimensions. This is the theory. Uh, I, I have the quartic, but I'm not putting it on the slide again. Uh, however, I want to stress that when you reduce from four to three, the cubic vertices remain. In fact, you can see that what was del del bar in the four dimensional theory is now del squared in the three dimensional theory. Uh, but I, as first pointed out by Marcus and Schwartz in 1983, the E8 invariant theory does not involve a cubic vertex. So I have to get rid of these cubic vertices because schematically the E8 invariant theory has this structure. Uh, uh, hand wavingly, what happens is that you have SO16 at play here and SO16 has these 128 spinner representations and you can't build an invariant out of three of those. So you're not allowed a cubic vertex. I will refer you to this paper for details. So uh, again, with N equals four, this is why I like the N equals four Yang Mills story because it captures the essence of the story. The same 256 degrees of freedom uh, uh, are here. They split into 128 plus 128. Here's the SO16. And now you build the same generators again. Here's the SU8. Here's the U1. Here are the coset generators. And you uh, the algebra closes as expected. So I, I do the cosets on this side, and I end up with the SU8 and the U1 on this side. So uh, in order to relate this to the, the, the theory without the cubic vertex, we perform the following field redefinition. This is work done with Lars Brink and Sucheta Majumdar. Uh, and then once you have the three dimensions, so now I'm schematically, uh, I schematically have this theory, kinetic plus quartic, modified quartic from field redefining away this. Once you have that, you do this oxidation procedure by carefully choosing a derivative and you do you you check for Lorentz invariant. You check that the derivative is well behaved and that you can go correctly from d equal to three to four without affecting any of the symmetries. And you can do that using this uh, quadratic form. And so what happens is you end up with the four dimensional n equals eight theory without with uh, enhanced E eight symmetry. So in other words, if I go back to this picture, I've now got here. So again, broadly speaking, this tells the story. You go down here, you do the redefinition, you oxidize back. This oxidation done carefully to not mess up any of the symmetries you, you picked up here. Uh, what are the concerns? So the concerns are that uh, I, I already mentioned one concern. You on, this has only been proved to third order in the coupling constant. So what? how do you know this holds to all orders? Uh, there are a couple of uh, strong statements, but I, I don't think they, they rise to the level of a serious uh, proof of any kind. Uh, the strong statements are that if you, if you look at light cone theories and everything we know about light cone theories, including E7 invariants and so on, you find the cubic vertex tends to be trivial. In fact, uh, covariantly as well, vanishes on shell, etc. cetera. Uh, but the quartic is non-trivial and the five point is even less trivial. So if you can get things to work at those two orders, then you find mostly it holds to all orders. But since I'm waving my hands, you can tell this is not a proof for all orders. Now, the more interesting question, and this is something we are discussing uh, at, at this year, is what are the tangible consequences for scattering amplitude cancellations? So in other words, what we are sort of saying is that uh, in, in, this, in this new picture, uh, one of the things we seem to be saying is that uh, in the light cone, you're not constrained to see scattering states as the metric is scattering, the gauge field is scattering, and so on. Everything breaks into the scalar components in this light cone language. Even, the, even a four vector has these two components, A and A bar, and I could treat them independently. So what this E8 is telling us is, that you need to count your, you need to collect your degrees of freedom in, in a particularly judicious manner. And then that collection will exhibit an enhanced E8 symmetry. So in, in uh, again, this, this is not, uh, this part, we, we don't have anything concrete 
to publish. But the way we are thinking about this is that if you pick, look at scattering amplitudes and you pick up a particular combination of states, choosing the external states based on what these symmetries are telling you, then a, a rather surprising combination of these states should exhibit this enhanced E8 symmetry. And you'll find that diagrams that E7 was not putting constraints on, E8 will. And that could explain partly the improved behavior in supergravity. So that, that's sort of the tangible uh, consequence I would like to see from this. Now, uh, let me move to my primary question. And I'm actually almost done. Uh, how am I doing for time, if I may ask? No, you're good. You can take. OK. So um, here is my primary question. And is there a hidden or enhanced symmetry in pure gravity in four dimensions? So I, I, I couldn't start with this because I don't have an answer to this by itself. I have an answer based on everything I've told you so far, and hence the title of my talk. So what is the thinking? If, you, if, if you're able to play this game of uh, go down one dimension, pick up a symmetry, field redefine, oxidize in the supergravity regime, what happens if I simply set all other fields to zero? Then I'm left with gravity. And does something similar happen with gravity? This is the question. This is open-ended, but let me show you what, what, what I, I do have to say about it. Here is the supergravity superfield. And by focusing on, so I, I mean to focus only on the plus two and minus two states of the graviton. And I'll throw everything else away uh, carefully. And I end up with the most convoluted description of gravity. Here's a description of gravity that will upset a lot of people, right? That it's, it's unnecessarily complicated. But the reason I like it is it allows me to continue using this framework I used and uh, use all the tools I've shown you so far. As long as I'm pretending, I'm pretending I'm doing super space theory, but secretly I'm just doing gravity. And so what you find is that gravity in four dimensions goes down to that with a cubic vertex. I do a field redefinition. I find an SU11 symmetry. And I'm able to lift the theory up, keeping this SU11 manifest. Let me try and outline what exactly is happening here. So for this, I go back to my slide on light cone gravity. Here's the slide on light cone gravity. In four dimensions, this was the Hamiltonian. You know I'm in four dimensions because you see del bars and dels. I'm going to reduce this to three dimensions. So uh, I have kinetic term, cubic term, quartic not shown here. And so I have this. Uh, and then I do this field redefinition, which I mimic what happened in superspace. So I did this field redefinition for n equals 8. I'm mimicking that here. And I end up with a new d equal to 3 Hamiltonian, which is the kinetic term plus quartic. And from this, I read off the Hamiltonian. What is in interesting is that you find there is an invariance. And the invariance is this. Uh, same criticism applies. This is to kappa squared and kappa cube, not beyond. Here's a variation of h with a parameter a. Here's a variation of h bar, parameter a bar, uh, actually mixed parameters. And the commutators of two such transformations are this, uh, work done with Lars Brink and Sucheta Majumdar. Uh, so here it is. Uh, if you split this transformation, so that the A terms are collected and the A bar terms are collected here into the following. I choose, I define L plus H, L plus H bar, L minus H, L minus H bar. And I define these operators, U1 type. Then you find they obey this algebra on, realized on the fields. And this is an SU11 algebra. And in some sense, this is uh, 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 the light cone realization of what is called the Ehlers symmetry in gravity in 3D. But this, because of this picture, because of this approach, is we are able to lift up here. And I will conclude my talk by saying that the same criticism that can be levied for n equals 8 applies here, which is uh, A, uh, you've only shown this to kappa cube, and B, what is the tangible consequence of this? So this is ongoing work. And so I don't have, I don't have I don't think we have anything useful to say yet on this point. So that's actually my talk. I'm, I seem to have finished about five minutes early, but thank you. Okay, let us thank Sudarshan for the wonderful talk. If anyone has any questions for the speaker, you can ask.
Thank you, Basil. I have a question. Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, can you speak up a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so basically, this uh, truncation you did for n equal to eight to pure gravity, uh, you can also do this for uh, uh, lower n. Like you can truncate n equal to eight to n equal to four, and will you get some enhanced symmetry? Like if uh, start with n equal to four, supergravity will have some AC one one symmetry, right? If you follow yeah. this path, will you get some enhanced symmetry? So and the the uh, I I think the problem happens in that step where I assume that the Hamiltonian is a quadratic form. and only when the hamiltonian is a quadratic form does my oxidizing derivative allow me to go uh, go up hold on let me just scroll up to n equals 4 where i think that was clearest sorry yeah so uh, it is it is this quadratic form that we oxidize because in this quadratic form we replace the derivatives by this uh, nabla and uh, the quadratic form unfortunately seems to work only for maximally supersymmetric theories uh -huh. okay. uh, so that i think is the missing step so uh, the 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 story is a little convoluted in that sense i mean i would have liked to uh, directly go i think the elephant in the room would be where the hell is your arrow going from here to here yeah. and i think part of this has to do with this uh, quadratic form structure and for any non maximally supersymmetric theories that is in there so then i would not be confident about lifting a symmetry up okay so then what happened for like when you did to pure super, uh, pure gravity okay you just work in the n equal to 8 formalism and just e exactly but the other interesting thing and i don't have an explanation for this is that we we can prove to kappa cube and for yang mills that non suzy theories also have this quadratic form structure that is you in the light cone you can write it as the square of an object mm -hmm. so it seems to work for n equals 0 and maximal suzy it doesn't work anywhere in between okay 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 thanks i think there are some questions in the chat box Yeah so i think uh, there's a question from ufo to everyone saying is it related to twister theory it is indeed and i see sucheta has answered this saying it's closely related to spinner helicity so this this uh, uh, i think the best place would be to look at this uh, uh, witten's paper of 2003 uh, where i think these are directly linked so that that would be the uh, perhaps that's what no this is much later but yes there is a direct link to that Okay. Any more questions? Any physical interpretation for the square root Hamiltonian? So uh, this is uh, interesting. I I don't know. Uh, I think one of the things that immediately is of interest is what is W equal if if the Hamiltonian is W dot W, what is W equal to zero? What 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 does one get out of that? Uh, I I think one of the things we've been looking at recently again with Lars and Sucheta is uh, connections to BMS symmetries, uh, but I don't have a direct uh, physical interpretation for this. yet mm, um, i have a comment on this square root of hamiltonian yeah yeah please go ahead uh, so uh, for super gravity we don't know that very well yet but for gravity recently we also saw uh, there is some connection with the bms symmetry so uh, the square root might be related to uh, positivity of energy in super gravity and gravity so but we are still trying to learn more about it but that is one, that is what sudarshan basically said when you said w equals 0 is it related to the vacuum solutions and so on you said it better and i agree <laughs>
Okay, if there are no more questions. Let's thank the speaker again. And thank see you. The, see you guys next time. Yeah, thanks a lot.